This is a production of Cornell University. That was cool. I didn't have to do anything. Um, welcome, everybody. This is the class of 2016 MFA graduation reading, which is super weird that that happened so fast. Um, a huge thank you to all the family and friends who drove or flew or just slogged up the hill on a Saturday. We very much appreciate you guys being here. Um, I also want to say thank you to David Pickett, whose generous support of our program is going to fund the next four months of the eight of us writing, um, which is really wow. crucial time, and I know that we've all been looking forward to that since pretty much day one, so thanks to him. Um, I also want to say thanks to our generous and supportive faculty, uh, Stephanie Vaughn, John Robert Lennon, Helena Viramontes, Ernesto Quinones, and Maureen McCoy, who came out of retirement to teach us for a semester last year. Um, thanks to Michael Cook for all the soup lunches and, of course, for the amazing experience at Epic Magazine. Am I dipping out a little bit? Hopefully it'll come back in. Um, thanks to all of our workshop peers for the time and energy that you guys put into reading our work. Um, and lastly, thank you to everyone in the administrative office for keeping us on top of everything that we're supposed to be doing. Sometimes we need help with that. Um, and thanks to Sarah Rice for organizing the reading today. Um, finally, please silence your cell phones if you have not already, and I will introduce your first reader. Uh, Samson Jardine is a poet who hails from Rhode Island, and a poet who Rhode Island hails as one of their best. He studied at Parsons School of Design and University of Rhode Island, and is the recipient of a Rhode Island Council of the Arts Fellowship in Poetry for his book, Galilee. Please welcome Samson Jardine. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming on a Saturday. I'm going to read from a sequence of poems called Off Broadway. On a low chain link fence, crowns of razor wire mirror the grass. Wind curves the shadows of corn stalks on a road ending in green hills and a white church spire. The mesh holes are rigid as prison windows on the car radio with its sermons, where the guy talks, blaring the book of Job with the speed of winter bellows, reciting his rage, then his faith, in the life of ash, a whirlwind's words, and things that die before they grow, since his suffering was as blessed as his blind search. The kingdom always keeps back what people know, but leaves its ruins, not the bruised banners of white birch, the river's foam scythes muttering for their iron models, but the tank with Vietnam camo, left in rain or snow. Now is the season of desert storm, arches of McDonald's, cupped palms of gray clouds, their pilgrimage of prayer, their rosaries of rain shattering on the sidewalk, since our history is as indivisible as air or the shadows of silver wheat that whisper their seeds as wet Confederate flags wave from the flatbed of a rusted Ford and wind dries its star-spangled creed. Wind that changes while the sun tears its wax paper scraps on the helmets of ants keeping to their armored tread. The steaming deli is the size of a train car. The second-hand radio is silent. News from home is in hiding. Orange pan smoke whines for the smell of the bazaar. After exile, any ember kindled from home is guiding. Scallop-ridged storm clouds, the black womb of stars, the frozen crow of a unibrow 
gratitude for anything gliding, a crooked eagle's nose, or the cold arc of a trigger. Dressed in white aprons, the Tunisian and the Ugandan stacking boxes are bickering over what country is bigger. The tone is two bows stamping lassos of dust, clashing their horns for sport, chafing the bone. Dust corkscrews from the counter, sunlit DNA. A map of drifting frost glazes the tidal pools in the eyes of the woman waiting for me in the doorway. Sputtering gold flakes splinter our train windowsill. Far away, Hudson waves crest, flashing their cameras. Taxis crawl with metal snouts, sniffing the behind of the city bus closing its white accordion waist, while soaring crows shriek as if they've gone blind. Bright gold bulbs with a snail's coiling symmetry. Teardrops of glass spiraling with synthetic grace on a convex sign erasing its neon calligraphy. I envy its electric piece its simple birthplace, below scaffold bars that shed their rusted skin. Crowds are circling a car trapped on zebra stripes, confirming it ends where it starts, our search for origin. A cracked stoplight, the city's sundial reignites. Our oracles without oaths flash and fade before they begin. The silvery legions of nodding maggots, river lights, they haven't needed a myth to unite their movement. Continents of steam flood on the corner window. Take the banners of plastic bags with their own government, rustling on the curb, reciting a pledge of allegiance to the beauty of the black sky that brightens again with crumbling tablets of clouds, Genesis and Credence, charcoal scripture and audibly chanting Amen. Voices rattle from a white van's mechanical thunder, which striding pigeons hear, cleaning their purple chest plates as storefront windows reflect their vacant wonder. Again, I don't know. It was a boulevard or an avenue. And I don't know if that matters or what that means, but the sky between the brick buildings was pale blue and the sun poured squadrons of gold plated Marines propping their bannered spears on vinyl siding. Not new for the day and age but there was some other something in the android worms of telephone wire shadows programmed to bend on the curb that remembers nothing. Praise to amnesia, then, to accommodations, no? Bulbous trash bags sweat in the furnace of summer. There was tension in silver fences Stairs neatly swept. Marble lions with lidless eyes watching the runners, forgetting their prey, the star-triggered horns that never slept. While a hopper cloud canvas was a windshield's lover, as iron roses circled the ring handle of a gate, and flaking rust gentrified its paper-thin petals. This was the northern decay, a disease I propagate. A sewer grid coughed its geyser of liquid metals, BB gun pellets of mist dissolving to their source, light and wind, one place where no evil on earth is new, where our dead survive time and win its remorse, where stunted tree shadows or the clock the sun turns to. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. And now we have the poet Vincent Hiscock. Um, Vincent is from the Sierra Nevada in Northern California. Got a Vassar education like Edna St. Vincent Millay, Chloe's favorite poet. <laughs> um, and then worked in Richmond, Virginia at an elementary school. Um, Vincent is reliably irreverent, has a big dialectical brain, which was his excuse for never voting simply yes or no on epic submissions. <laughs> And a huge ethical heart, uh, and all of these things navigate and ultimately find an accord in his powerful poetry. Vincent Hiscock. It was so nice. I'm going to first read from a long poem. It starts. Um, thinking about uh, going to these camp meetings in South Lake Tahoe as a kid, these religious camp meetings um, as a little kid and then in the next stanza as an adolescent. Burnt out trunk honeyed full with a fall hive wall, light dies and darkening coals still have a half life like jewels so give sparkle to this half night grave and yet serene as a fancy fretwork of imagined things, pointillist plays upon a lack of sight becoming complete. Next morn, young boys hurl rock sticks, wood chips get little cuts, attaining the rush of being party to an imagined scene of greater gore and death till one cries distraught, scared for mother's wrath at dirty clothes, a shirt in pieces, and returns tentwards as others beg him not to tell the truth about these games of war, and eight birds together rise from bow to sunlight. Back to the fire pit, triumvirate kids wheel magic into a stick come sword, take a crack at that rotted out stump come hive, astonished as it turns to dust in a churning whirl of bees fly straight for us. Will and I mill about while Isaiah's arm fills with fluid he cannot find the words for pain, his eyes sing. His parents enlist me in a faux mission for ointment to dredge up the venom in the vein which remains. I ask around and for help and bring back honey. Two years later, pubescent, a girl persuades me the spirit world is more a dream than we wholly there by a river cutting its way down the stairs in the land water snaking towards a lake moonlit gray, reaching for the crevices beneath her to fill the gaps that come with new needs or wants, both of us bony and nervous, her nails raking across my arms, me wanting to speak but maiden-tongued. Next day I answer to the camp phone and listen to my brother, he was in full-blown psychosis for the first time. Burnt out trunk honeyed full with the fall hive wall, light dies and darkening coals still have a half life like jewels. So give sparkle to this half night grave and yet serene as a fretwork of imagined things pointillist plays upon a lack of sight becoming complete. Um, in a later section, um, I'm with a uh, past uh, lover in Poughkeepsie, New York. Youngling, the sun glow, flush, eyes tired, trying to get out of bed, yard frost out the window, fire pit, a red canvas chair, the clang and rattle of the radiator coming on again. You give a little yawning stretch. I take some bottles out of the recycling, a man is already working a spray gun on the building, all four stories in two days. Back inside, you are getting dressed, and I rub your back and undo your progress. We sit still a moment here, the hiss of dull green paint, new over an old whiteboard frame. You check the time, and we have a sudden rustle and rush, drawing away from the day as we compose it, answering to so many predictions. Just out the door, I am caught 
by a mockingbird imitating the screech of a stake against car metal, the good surprise of winter making my hair entirely brittle, still wet from the shower, good to make mind over to the actual hour of a world recalling itself. The garage next door is a thicket of garbage tumbling into crusts of snow, cruddy archipelagos that embranch and swirl in leaves. A dog named Woody digs about, 50 geese fly overhead, and the high flat blare of a radio comes on behind a kitchen window. All of it reminds me of growing up in prefabs up in pine country, of my old playmate Joe cutting trail now in the Tahoe National Forest, the couple part-time hours that they give, and of my brother getting tased 16 times by cops in the East Bay, manic and cocaine sick. And somehow all this makes me miss California, the land at least, the one part of my home state I'm not afraid to see. It is approximately 12 hours until I see your particular legs, again, small knees, hamstrings, firm feeling length of you, belly breathing, lifting beautifully, high wine of the rafters, and the wind knocking hard, the hall door shut. Um, this is a poem I wrote for a friend, uh, Hannah, while she was um, teaching in Detroit, um, and having a rough time. Um, it's called Passages Now, but I haven't thought of a good title, so feel free to give me ideas afterwards. Glow and red dash of a car a mile ahead, a few street lights and the golden dot of a house light in the distance makes me think the highway floats dubiously to the right up ahead. A tall boy paps in an enormous midnight sky driving back from Charlottesville to Richmond. Pine crowded country road darkness, unsure where the road branches. I get back to the highway with the gas light on take each downhill stretch with the clutch in and 20 nervous minutes later chug and glide to the pump of a shell the backlit logo a grace of yellow inside three truck drivers laugh as they wait for a shower tired giddy in the overbright fluorescence i buy a couple quarts of pins oil synthetic sour straws marble reds in the gas station lot, I stop by the ice chest and listen to the flapping lines of flags smoke while my car fills up and think of you 500 miles north and west in a labyrinth of cold makeshift housing highways empty as this one on the fetal arm of a land torqued back and lapped at by a black lake. There are enough lights embayed bread, embayed breadcrumbs in a boreal bird swarm to trace a way home, swallow the grounds left of places and past now gone, and stretch the thought through this worn juncture and draft of clouds against a galvanic sky that the night could somehow be for us good. And lastly, I'll read uh, this little short poem called High Sierra. Come out the break into the face of the hill, the fool, Spill of sun glare, hazes dust into air, arcades and down, drift. A scattering of snap, dragons points up. 7,000 feet and cattle low in the field, steam things amidst a morning veil, a cloud liquefying upon their backs. This broad-shouldered land, ridges, that overtop a continent of birds, hot with noon sun or quickened by the sea breeze off a cold Pacific, returns its axis to the same degree, each day skies processions of flight. I flew back in August. I saw the green cascade, earth a still wave, the snowmelt eking into rivulets that cut pylon stairs out of the granite spleen of the hills, heard the cowbells in the mountain air, the ground wearing the names of saints, 
Our Lady's slippers, virgins, gloves, James Wart, St. Peter's herb, all reaching for the same orbital curve. Kirsten Saracini was born in Atlantic City. She grew up in Philly. She went to Penn and then moved to Brooklyn. If I recall correctly, in both of those places, she worked in hospitals uh, as an amazing person. And <laughs> in New York, she worked in high schools and then at the editorial staff at uh, One Story. Kirsten is currently working on a narrative nonfiction book, uh, of which I believe you're about to hear the first bit. Her writing is sometimes wild, light, and humorous, sometimes grave, earnest, intent, or both at once, but much like herself, it is always strong, clear, beautiful, and brave. Thanks to Vincent for the beautiful introduction and poems. Uh, yes, this is the working introduction of the narrative nonfiction book I'm chomping away at. Um, thanks everyone for being here and thanks for listening. The last thing my father said to me was, if you don't turn off the DVD player, you owe me $10. He stood on the stairs in sweatpants under the dusty golden light and I turned back to the television. Weeks later, at his memorial service, I stood at the podium in front of thousands of strangers in pilots' uniforms or black, who crowded the pews, huddled in the aisles, and spilled over the church steps to the tarmac where the news fans waited. The adults of my life had told me to imagine the audience naked, and I had smiled the way nice children do when they're given weird, unhelpful advice. <laughs> I felt calm and full of purpose, as I stepped onto the stool and leaned into the microphone. I had baby crimped my hair and put a little glitter over my eyes, and I was wearing a limited suit jacket and skirt that fit strangely even though it was now the most expensive outfit I owned. I kept expecting Dad to come down the aisle with some great lesson for me, followed by a joke, a hug, and a stern talking to for spending too much money on some clothing. As I read the rhyming card I'd written for Dad's birthday weeks before, my voice boomed unrecognizably off the rafters. At zero, you wanted my name to be Victoria Forevermore. At one, you bought me Ernie from the Japanese toy store. I went on reminding Dad how he taught me to read, pray, bargain, prank, to love and be alive, basically. I'd never read the ending aloud, and I was unmoored when I had to say, and for all the years that come, I know one thing will never change. You will always be my daddy, and I will always feel the same. I love you. Suddenly, the audience was very there. Butts adjusted on wooden pews, paper programs rustled. Scattered strangers moaned or sobbed. I needed to lighten the mood quickly and shared my unprecious last moment. Uh, the last thing my dad said to me was, if you don't turn off the DVD player, you owe me 10 bucks. But with the laughter came the knowledge that I was speaking to people who hadn't known my father's fierce love. I didn't want to unnerve the strangers or shame my father, so I made up a better ending. This, of course, was followed by, I love you and good night. My half-inch heels clacked towards the piano over the jittery quiet. Someone tried to suppress a cough. And though I was too shy to try out for musicals at school, I did what was so obviously the thing to do, sing for my father. All summer, my sister and I had harmonized over dad's Gibson acoustic in our living room. Now I nodded to the accompanist in the suit. My legs didn't wobble, my throat didn't close, and I didn't feel self-conscious until later, when I learned my unrequited eighth grade crush was in the audience. 
And I didn't feel embarrassed and angry until my singing was played on the six o'clock news and newspapers published my poem saying it had been written by some Kristen or Kirsten I didn't know. And I didn't feel buried until ph photographers sold the only moment that I cried, though I had wiped away the tears quickly. And some man wrote an op-ed about how the future of America was going to be all right because I had done some crap at a memorial. When I was finally able to start processing my father's death in a real way, 13 years later, I popped the cassette recording of the memorial into the tape deck of my parked Nissan. It was the only tape deck I had. So I sat in the driver's seat on a tree-lined street in Brooklyn, fast forwarding through the pastors to listen to my speech for the first time. Why the tape then, I couldn't say. I've always been impatient and hungry to know as much of myself as possible. And I've always felt limited against so much mystery. I was listening to own something or let go, unearth or bury the memory, level up in consciousness, whatever it was that would get rid of the pain weighing down the beautiful tender moments that were now mine to seize. I was 26 and in love. I'd quit working in hospitals, high schools, and social work agencies to cobble together some poorly paying jobs that had anything to do with writing, living the life I wanted for the first time, perhaps, which is why, I think, the grief was coming in loud and vicious waves. I was finally happy enough to handle some of it. I could still codger the opening of the speech in my mind and feel what I felt then, calm, cool, stoic. I reclined in the seat, gritty with biscuit crumbs and sand, and waited to hear my 13-year-old voice stoically say, my father was the hardest person to buy for because if he wanted something, he'd just go out and get it. So for his birthday, I collected hundreds of tiny seashells and wrote this poem for him. Finally, my voice sounded through the card speakers, young, nasal, soft. My father, that old me began. And even though the voice was feeble and delicate, I conjured a proud chin, cool eyes. Was the hardest person to die for, uh, a buy for, so for his birthday, Die instead of buy. How did I not remember that? I hit the pause button and looked at the dashboard to the passenger seat, back and forth, as if, as if there were someone to share the surprise with. Inside me turned some unknowable significance. I closed my eyes to access the memory of what it felt like to be in that moment at the lectern. And there I was again, feeling strong, cool, calm, but the tape. I rewound, pressed play, heard the parapraxis again, that Freudian slip. Thank you. Uh, Aurora Masum Javed is a writer, performance, artist, educator, and activist from the Bay. She is also one of the most open-hearted, spirited people I know. And have you heard her laugh? <laughs> Two years ago, I was at a party with friends and we heard someone choking. <laughs> it was this methodical, loud gasping. <gasps> and we dropped our mini hot dogs to go help. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so anyway, we dropped our mini hot dogs to go help this person in danger. This was my first encounter with the laugh. Even with the epic door closed, the laugh resounded and echoed through Goldwyn Smith Hall, delighting and annoying and confusing many. <laughs> I will leave you with this. Hordes of sea lions bank on the docks of Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Depending on the season, hundreds of these brown and oily eared seals are known to bask in the sun, mating and moaning. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Years ago, our tender hearted Aurora went with a group of friends to walk around, eat popcorn, whatever, and someone made her laugh. The sea lions responded. <laughs> Aurora, everyone. <laughs> It's a high.
hard act to follow. I feel very honored to be the one to follow. Oh, man. You got me crying already, and I haven't even started reading. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, um, especially to the poetry professors. Um, my chair, Lyra, you have made all the difference. <laughs> you did this. this is <laughs> um, thank you to all the poets and friends that have helped these poems come to being. Fine lines. The barber traces the tall man's beard for the third time. Trim between the eyebrows, smooth fade of high top, meticulous. I have always wanted this, quiet love of men. So I sit on the cracked leather couch, watch. A small boy spins in his red chair, cape billowing like a gown. His father cups a corona beside me, hollers with every basket. Warriors crush the heat on three screens. Banter rises, breathes. The boy eyes the blade near his face. Big man, the barber says. I got you, but I know his fear, the danger of a hand, my own. How in sixth grade, Tony taught us to be boys. Fight, he said. So we did. Raised fists, stiff. Until our need was too big, need to be anything but girls. How I hunted her then, slammed her into brick, blood oozing from the back of her head. Tony had never seen hurt like that, but I had. My mother's, Abba with a bat in his fist, the footfall the slap, his body cuffed, thrust to a bed of sirens, the beginning of our end. Somewhere now, he slices a loaf of bread, cradles the warmth of his second wife's breast. Somewhere, he is gentle. He stays. And I am grown and part him. I've learned to sweeten men with my mouth. But here, the barber's touch is just touch. Here, the boy twirls. Curry fires a three, every voice becomes a trumpet unabashed. When the barber calls my name, I ask him to cut lines into my head. I got you, he says. My lashes brush his wrist. His hand tilts my chin. Soft, certain. The next poem is called, A Woman Cries on the A. You think brave. Say worthy. Say galaxy. Lit orbit of heat and hydrogen. She, familiar wet. Her bright face, unadorned, alone. Vulnerable, stoic, and you, stranger. No screen or pain, just breaking. You think of your mother, her blue robe crusted with black dye. Days, she couldn't rise. Weeks, she moved only for solitaire, mahjong, 
woman who lived off string theory, Darwin feasting on Cheerios, singing herself small Bangla prayers. But she knew God was a lie, and everything that wove, wove between you, silence, a punishment, a freedom. She had no one. You had her. Where to put your hands? On the train, you catalog touch. A father, his baby's sleeping belly. The only. The woman's sadness, aisle away. Not disease, but reasoned response, infinite, ordinary. What it takes to survive, faith in self, discreet, singular cell, her body like your body, like your mother's body. There is a pact we're not making, retreating as we do to our sterile machines, stacked houses, two forces in every universe. What pulls together, what pushes apart, matter, energy, void, expanding, and still the moon, how it stays, debris made whole, emergence of water and blood, you speck of earth, you human who needs. You don't know what love is, only that it frightens you. Gravity a longing to collide, each of us conjoined, mouthing autonomy. And the last poem is called The Bridge, The Gate. Oh, I'm okay, thank you. <laughs> That's so sweet. <sighs> thank you. The bridge, the gate. The patrolman approaches slow. Scared, I will jump. He is so young. I have no intention today of leaving my body. I've paused only to watch the surfers collide with the Pacific. Strange symmetry, what the wave gives, what it takes. Where one bails beneath the break, another glides to shore. See, I want to say, we live. Every poem contains the dead, animals, crawling back to worry the bones, buffalo, elephants, men. I have a habit of avoiding funerals. Instead, I keep, play Scrabble with Nanu, her nose too close to the board. Brian calls just cause, reports spring kiss, another man's lips. She never collapsed into coma and further. His mother never found him hanging. I admire the forest floor, log decaying, root reaching for root, no partition, what rots feeds what was, is, even as. Thank you.
next writer is Lena Wynn. She grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and graduated from Arizona State University and the Barrett Honors College with degrees in creative writing and political science. Her fiction has appeared in the Harvard Review, as well as in the book Creating Life from Life, Biotechnology and Science Fiction. Her stories have won awards in competitions such as the Jules Anatoly Creative Writing Contest and the Worldwide Writers of the Future Competition. Lena has a deep love of speculative and futurist fiction and is currently working on her second science fiction novel. She is also one of the most hilarious and entertaining storytellers I have ever met. And her brain is wild and a beautiful wilderness. And I'm so excited to hear you read. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to write or read you a short story that is uh, had its DNA lifted from the thesis novel that I'm currently writing. It's a science fiction novel about a psychologist trapped on a spaceship where all of her patients begin to experience the same nightmares and delusions. And she likes robots. And so do I. Um, <laughs> if you were to talk to anybody in this program and that you were to ask them about me, they would be like, oh, that's the weird robot chick. So this story is about robots. Um, come and take me home. She was waiting in the park for her robot to pick her up when the bombs went off. She was waiting in the park because it was embarrassing for a girl of her age to be picked up by a robot from school. Such a thing was only necessary for small children who needed chaperones to guard them against getting lost or kidnapped. But she, Grace, was no longer a child. She was tall and light-boned and beginning to develop breasts. And so it was embarrassing to have her robot pick her up where all of her classmates could see. So she made him meet her at the park instead. When she'd first told the robot not to come to her school, she'd worried that he would be offended. But the robot had only said, I understand, and what about his business? <laughs> I understand was his default program phrase, the robot's most basic factory setting. It was like a baby smiling when you smiled at it, or a dog wagging its tail when you called its name. Essentially an empty verbal cue that indicated that her words had registered, but he had nothing better to say. How much did he really comprehend, rather than simply hear, she often wondered. How much of it was just a ritual, shadow puppets making gestures at each other from across the wall, but never quite connecting without losing their shapes altogether. Sometimes she said it back to him, I understand. And then the robot said that he understood that she understood. <laughs> and then Grace said that she understood that he understood that she understood. And it became a little game between them, the words stacking up on top of each other like a tower of cards. They formed an echo chamber with each other, their understanding circling overhead invisibly. Despite her confusion about him, Grace did find her robot's presence comforting. There was something nice about the cool, calm quietness of his companionship at her shoulder, carrying her book bag, politely listening to her talk about her day. And this was why she didn't just tell him to stay at home. Instead, she had him meet, him, meet her at the park like an illicit lover so they could walk together without being seen by any of her schoolmates, such as Jenny Testa. Jenny Testa was not a mean person. On the surface, she was nice to everybody, and she smiled and held the door for the underclassmen without any snide remarks. But Grace knew that Jenny Testa's father, Mr. Testa, was one of those pro-flesh people, one of those radicals who went to protests waving embarrassing hand-printed signs about robots taking jobs from humans and how all robots needed to be destroyed so that everyone could go back to their roots as if manually shoveling dirt and soil and what few farms were left was what made people truly people, was what would take them back to their pure atavistic state when they barely had any fire, tore the throats out of saber-toothed tigers with nothing but their teeth and some sharpened stones, as if going back to that would make them any better than what they were now. Jenny Testa never brought up the subject of robots at school, but Grace felt that she, surely she had inherited her father's hatred his penchant for joining the boiling crowds that sometimes erupted around the city and tore apart some innocent courier android or a sex bot waiting on a street corner, scattering their limbs to the streets, their synthetic skin flapping like loose chicken flesh. Grace wanted to protect her robot from people like Jenny Testa and her father, wanted to keep them from seeing him, because if they couldn't see him, then they couldn't harm him. 
Also, Jenny Testa was dating a boy, which was very mature for their age. Usually, you practice with another girl first. Everyone thought that she was very cutting edge for dating him, even though Grace privately thought that the boy, Harry Bipp, was not so good looking and always seemed to be adjusting himself. And so, Grace didn't want Jenny to catch Grace doing something so immature as walking around with her robot, who was better looking than any boy at school, but who didn't count because he was a robot. Normally, the robot was never late. Grace didn't know what was holding him up. Five minutes had already passed since she'd begun waiting, which was longer than she'd ever taken to show up. After all, robots were programmed to have routines and to never deviate from them. Someone said they were just like clockwork. Though Grace was a little unsure of what that meant, not knowing what clockwork was. But maybe her mother had ordered the robot to run some errand on the way and had forgotten to notify Grace. Or maybe he was getting some maintenance done at the robot maintenance center a block away. She had noticed that he'd been blinking a lot lately, and there was the smell of ozone around him, which sometimes meant that his processors needed tidying up. They were getting a little cluttered, and some information would have to be consolidated to make things run smooth. Yes, that must be it. He might have mentioned it to her earlier that morning, and she might have simply forgotten. Maybe she ought to go over to the center to check to see if he was still there, or at least meet him coming down the street. Six minutes had passed by now. Far too long to just be standing around by herself. She felt uneasy without him at her side. It felt empty like the hole the dentist had left in her mouth after extracting her last baby tooth before discovering there was no adult tooth to replace it. She could see the green, brilliant LED sign of the maintenance center beyond the treetops of the park. The sky around it was turning orange, tinged with muffled streaks of mandarin and gold and pink, and a kind of burbling chatter was rising from the park to mingle with the creamy sky. There was a young mother with dark smudges under her eyes, pushing a baby in a gravipram, and a little scruffy dog nosing around in the weeds, and a cicada complaining somewhere in the leaves overhead, and a tangled-haired couple thrashing around into the bushes. Grace tried not to stare at this last part, even though it was pretty common nowadays. There were no laws about public decency or indecency anymore. As she tried not to watch the couple wrestling silently with each other, suddenly the girl half of the couple sat up, her mouth separating from the boy half of the couple with a peculiar rustling noise, as if their lips had gone dry and papery from the heat of their love. Without speaking, she rose from the bushes and shook out her long, shining hair and made a gesture for him to watch. She said something to him that Grace couldn't hear over the thrumming of the cicada. She imagined it was something like, I love you, or you make me so hot, baby, or this is how happy I am. And then the girl turned and did three perfect cartwheels through the grass, one after the other after the other, and Grace stood there looking at her openly, suddenly delirious, drawing in the world in tiny increments. Because the cartwheels were so perfect, so pure, she'd never seen a living thing move like that. Something about it opened something inside of her, like a key turning inside a hidden lock, like all the lights of a little house being thrown on, the girl's simple body parting the air, the parabola of her spine in motion, the sweaty scraps of hair swaying out in front of her, freckles and heat. And suddenly it all made sense to Grace. And that was when the bombs went off. Grace felt it bef before she heard it, a sudden hot clenching of the air over her head, a low boom like the door of a distant vault swinging shut. She turned to look at the source of the feeling, the noise, and saw that the green sign of the robot maintenance center had disappeared from the tree line. In its place was a dark fist of smoke rising up into the sky, bruising and purpling the clouds. The blast of distant heat felt like the buzz of a mild electric current against her skin. Everywhere there was the sound of screaming, faint and droning like the cicada, who had gone silent. The couple by the bushes were holding each other. The air was alive with fear and awe. The sky was both brighter and darker than she'd ever seen it. Suddenly it seemed to Grace that everything in the world had come to life, was ablaze, was beautiful and terrible and vivid and shining like copper, glinting deeply like a metal limb. It had been seven minutes since she'd begun to wonder when her robot would come. And suddenly, Grace felt as if she could stand and wait forever. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening, everybody, and thank you for coming. I want to introduce Corey Williams next. Um, probably the most amazing poet, instructor, scholar, and most critical reader that Epic has ever seen. 
I think the entire semester that we worked there, <laughs> Corey never once accepted a submission. His tastes, his tastes are that high and that sophisticated. He's that discerning of a reader, and I mean sarcasm. Um, Corey is an amazing poet, as I said, and instructor here at Cornell. He grew up in suburban Chicago during his undergraduate career at Illinois Wesleyan University. He studied abroad at Hartford College and the University of Oxford. Before coming to Cornell University, he earned a master's in the humanities from the University of Chicago. His work appears in Of Zeus, Glitterwolf, Colloquium, Azarakis, and Fogged Clarity. And he lights up every room that he walks into. <laughs> Thank you. Why, hello. So we're tired now. There's just so much brilliance just thrown on us right now. So I just need us to just stand and stretch for a minute. Like I'm not playing. Like let's stand and stretch for a minute. Get ourselves together. See, I look, see, look at you. Yes, yes. Get it all out, get it all out. I am so proud of all of my darlings. I am so proud. <laughs> now we can sit down and get ready for me because I don't know what this is about. So of course, there are many, many people to thank, um, including Cornell as an institution, the English department, the faculty, our generous sponsor, David Pickett, um, all of my MFA and PhD darlings who I just, I love and I learned so much from all of you. Um, thank you very much. And I also wanna give a special shout out to my ingenious advisors, advisors, Elena Maria Vidamontes and Blyre Van Cleve Stefanen, both of whom I just don't understand that <laughs> for them to be geniuses as they are, but to also be as warm and loving and supportive as they are. And I also want to thank my lovely, ever loving, ever supportive parents who are here in the audience. <laughs> And of course, my mother would raise her hand because that's just how she is. <laughs> and since tomorrow is Mother's Day, I want to dedicate this reading to my mother. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read four poems so you know about how long we, you have to wait till I step down. Um, <laughs> the first three come from my poetry novella, which I'm one of those weird people who's trying to you know, make that bridge between fiction and poetry. So these first three are from my poetry novella, and I hardly ever know what to say about it without making it sound super reductive. So I'll just say that the speaker is a visual artist and his lover suffers from chronic depression. Um, and you'll notice that I'm obsessed with water and light. So here we go. Though like a wanderer, your pirogue gently sways as we drift across the lake, its bronze mirrors too tarnished to reverse our faces. Since my hands can't be trusted, you row on your own. What if I fall overboard? You won't. I could. Let me teach you to swim. But what about alligators? I brought my pistol. What if, just relax, but this was your idea. I know, but we should have stayed home. You moor us onto an islet where a swamp rat toddles to its burrow. Feigning courage, I call your name as two great blue herons wade into view, then vanish behind Tupelo gum trees. So what's the catch of the day? Bluegill sunfish. Won't you help me with the bait? And so you do, as clouds make and unmake themselves, subject to winds that take what's theirs and what isn't, like someday when shadows will lift us away to a place we call better or home, but is nowhere and everywhere, just winding lake, looming wood, blinding sky, a little wind, 
those clouds and their turning, how turning to is always turning from, moving on, sometimes only to turn back again. This next one is called, There, Let the Way Appear. I press a lathered washcloth across your chest and belly. So this is all our lives have been leading to. Retching feels the bathroom air. Reaching above my head, I open the window, drawing the scent of sweet alyssum like honey like stillness after rage. Hush, you're talking nonsense. I lift your elbow to clean beneath your arm, and again, a gust of musk. I've lost it. As if the search was over, or had never begun. As if you'd been set loose on the wind like ashes. But you're right here. It's this house, those eyes, cloudy, almost blue, following my hand as it glides toward your growing, which for me, for the first time, feels unseemly. To be washed, yet to be exposed, since between them, there is no distinction. Who speaks for you now? Then the silence of waiting, though an answer will never come. For what can you say when even the truth is unbelievable? Water dripping from the cloth, chiming in the tub, drumming on your chest, brings me back into my flesh. Thank goodness the smell of you is gone. Outside, rushing in. This last one from the poetry novella is entitled Steal All My Songs Shall Be. And it's after um, Carl Phillips's um, title poem from his collection, Speak Low. Steal All My Songs Shall Be. From dusk of dawn to dawn of dusk, wind drifts on water. Air for water to break into you breaking into water. But to say you're all one is not to say you're indistinguishable, only beholden to one another. Water takes to the earth that holds it, though it too acts on earth. But what I think I see and what I think I ought to see are somehow beyond logic, as when what's there and what's known seem no longer the point, or how, breaking into air, water is to itself a distortion like any other. Light through skin, through water, bending until bending is the only life it's come to. And then this last poem has nothing to do with the poetry novella. I don't know, maybe it does. I think I'm just kind of writing myself out of this poetry novella, but either way, it's not going in the book, so. <laughs> and also what's funny is that I was recently talking to a friend about, po about poem titles, and we were saying how single word titles are the best. Um, and then I realized I'm such a hypocrite because all of my poem titles are super long. <laughs> but I can be capricious if I want to be, so. <laughs> This is my last poem. Surrounded by so great a cloud. We take the shadow path through wildering swords, forgetting the starlessness that came before, as if walking away is the same as forgetting. Windfall of apple trees, now fallen, they lose their names, married to a thing that worries how it looks like timelessness, though really, it's untimely. A different kind of disquiet. Listen and you'll see. Geese among the willows, pacing in leaf light, 
the crack of baseball bats just beyond the heel. Cheerless play, or merely practice, unlike geese and goslings yet in flight. And that's when I see it, angel wings, how some will never touch the blue of sky, how fed and touched. We did this. We eased their hunger. The want for nothing that flightlessness allows will leave them lonesome, wallowing in the dust until, as it has to, the wallowing stops. Let's keep to the path along the creek. Water in shadow, brooding branches quiver, different from smoke trees with blistered fingers snatching at boysenberry cloudbursts, cinders swarming as a pall above watercolor light. From our vantage, the sun moves at the nether reaches of smokeless smoke. Don't look away, not yet. So I look as if I'm looking, finding full on sun. I wait now unmoved for my eyes to blear. Not an impasse, but a form of faithfulness in what's seen by unseeing. Love is like that, sure. Perhaps unseenness, not invisibility, but refusal to look, makes for wilderness shadows unaccounted for. I thought I'd been fixed to an anti-life. I knew you weren't. Rustle of denim, burst of spotted touch-me-not, seeds adrift in watery light. Thank you. Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, now to introduce our amazing MC for the afternoon, the ever lovely Christine Vines. Uh, Christine Vines is a fiction writer from Wichita, Kansas. For four years before coming to Cornell, she bartended and ran a monthly reading series in New York City. Like that's just all her bio says, but as everyone else has been doing, we add a little extra. <laughs> Christine, I had the grand pleasure of working with Christine a full semester. It was just the two of us at there in the Epic office, just gabbing away. We probably could have got a little more work done, but you know, it's okay. But what I learned, more than just how lovely she is, more than just how poised she is, and more than just how fashionable she is, just how truly easy it is to talk to Christine which is a quality that very few people have. That sounded awful, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but Christine has it. So, <laughs> thank you. Here comes Christine. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Um, we did do some work at Epic. <laughs> So, you know, um, okay. Thank you guys for sticking with us. Um, this story is called spoils. First up was Humphrey the camel. In fact, the whole thing had begun over Humphrey the camel. Get that pile of beanbag junk out of my life forever, please. Lizette had said originally all yours. But when Doug began to pull them from the plastic bins they lived in for over a decade, Humphrey's dangling camel legs caught her eye. She remembered their five-year-old son, sick in bed, their son as a five-year-old, sick in bed, giggling at the way he could make it dance. Actually, I'll take that one, she said, checking to see if it still had a tag. Oh, no, you don't, Doug countered. Humphrey's my favorite. I'm keeping him. Your favorite? How old are you? I'm giving you the whole rest of this bin for one camel. You just called them beanbag junk. I'll keep him. Thank you. And this was how a lawyer came to preside over the splitting of the Beanie Babies. 
the first in a long and dizzying line of asset divisions. Lisette, the lawyer said, tell us about why you should retain ownership of Humphrey the Camel. Well, Lisette sat up straighter and crossed her legs. Our son had a bad bout of strep at one point. I stopped by the drugstore to pick up an antibiotic and picked up Humphrey along with it. It was sort of our special thing, me and Brandon. Oh, bullshit, Doug interrupted. If it was so special, how come Brandon doesn't want it? He's not the most sentimental, our son, Lisette explained to the lawyer who hadn't asked. And suddenly, you're sappy McMusherson, Lisette sighed. Yet again, Doug was assuming that her even keel composure, this composure she worked to maintain, indicated some sort of emotional wasteland beneath. How was it he could never see past himself? She gave the lawyer an eyebrow raise that meant, see what I have to deal with? That look, that look was everything Doug hated about her. Humphrey was the first beanie baby they had given Brandon. Sure, okay, she'd brought him home, but who had actually played with the thing? It was the beginning of the father-son era, the era that predated girlfriends and baseball, the years in which Doug had been his son's best friend. Lisette knew this and was taunting him, cruelly and simply. Doug, the lawyer said, why should you retain ownership of Humphrey the Camel? Doug had already brought up the offending beanbag junk comment, which the lawyer hadn't found nearly as damning as he should have. Doug didn't trust him. Brandon and I wrote a whole camel play for Humphrey about his camel friends bullying him when they found out he was anti-smoking. <laughs> and then Brandon went and chain-smoked his way through high school, Lisette added, surprised to find such hostility in her voice. Perhaps she blamed Doug for this a little, the doctor whose son had impaled a pack a day. The lawyer looked down at his clipboard, which contained a checklist of all the Beanie Babies before them. Which Beanie Babies would either of you accept in exchange for Humphrey the Camel? None, Doug said. He's my favorite. <laughs> all the rest, Lisette said, with a forcefulness she was unaccustomed to, a forcefulness that felt strangely invigorating. All? You didn't want any last week. Doug looked at her, bewildered. Why are you being like this? Lisette, the lawyer said, are there some crucial beanie babies that would even the scale for you? Lisette looked at the pile of animals on the table and considered. Okay, well, the platypus, definitely. Oh, come on, Doug said, do you even know its name? The Princess Diana Bear, fine, Doug muttered. The snake, Doug rolled his eyes in assent. Stripes the zebra, wrong, Doug said, Ziggy the zebra. <laughs> Chocolate the moose. She remembered this one because Doug had long claimed the moose was his spirit animal, and she, when forced to choose, had once nominated chocolate moose as hers. When they found the toy in a department store, Doug had folded it upright and sang Lionel Richie's My Destiny to Lisette until she snorted into the row of beanie moose and a group of children looked up at them. The seal, the monkey, the octopus, now you're just choosing my favorites. She was not being nice, it was true. But who had been not nice to her first? Who'd said she had the emotional intelligence of a turkey? Who had implied that his erectile dysfunction was the direct result of the weight she'd put on these last few years, not even that much weight? Who had called her nonprofit a sorry excuse for a purpose now that Brandon was grown? And which of them had swallowed her tongue over and over when he had these explosions, had said simply, you don't mean that? The dog, the black bear, the monkey, Doug shook his head in his hands. He could be sentimental, yes, an overgrown 10-year-old who got his hands on a medical degree, if you were to ask his wife. But as she listed Beanie Babies, the octopus, the turtle, the eagle, with a dispassion that tore at him, Doug felt a whole string of years slip through his fingers. He remembered the Beanie Baby castle that he and Brandon had built from the cardboard box their computer had come in. Empty toilet paper roll towers, Baldy the eagle appointed lookout, Dobie the Doberman installed as guard, Speedy the turtle permitted to ferry friendly visitors across the moat on his shell. He thought of the year or more it had sat in the basement, awaiting presentation to newcomers, of the joy in Brandon's eyes when revealing the crawl space that only Slither the snake could fit through, the secret staircase that led to a secret room, the indifference, the hiccuped laugh with which his son told him last week there weren't any Beanie Babies he wanted to keep. I'm 28, Dad. That sounded so much like his mother's voice now. The whale, the unicorn, the frog, the graduating owl, for all her anger at her husband, her soon-to-be ex-husband, Lisette remembered the stupid graduating owl with some fondness. At Doug's behest, they'd given it to Brandon for his fifth grade graduation. At Lisette's behest, they'd given it to him later at dinner, not in front of his friends. 
He'd been on the brink of outgrowing the toys, and he'd lit right up and set the owl on the table at the fourth place setting at Chili's. They had all clasped hands for Grace, Brandon and Lizette each pinching one plush owl wing, and Doug had given thanks for their beautiful family and their intelligent son. Lizette had squeezed his hand twice, their code for, I love you. Oh, is that all? Doug asked. Lizette looked at the pile of animals left. All of the birds, actually. She separated out the swan, the blue jay, the ostrich, the parrot, the cockatoo, the kiwi, the pelican, the robin, the flamingo, the toucan, the holiday penguin, and the duck. You don't even like birds. Doug's voice shook. Tears were growing in his eyes. Tears that Lisette knew would humiliate him in front of this lawyer. Let him cry, she thought. Let him feel even the tiniest dose of her humiliation because of all the things she had felt this week. Anger, longing, loneliness, vertigo, despair, more anger, more longing, a bottomless pit of loneliness. It was humiliation that reigned when her husband of 30 years asked for a lawyer in the first place, when he told her this life had been suffocating him. Let the lawyer see what a pitiful man she'd married, the physician who cried over beanie babies. Who doesn't like birds, she said. The lawyer looked at his checklist. The only items left now were the raccoon, the otter, the two dragons, the skunk, the bull, and the praying bear. You can't have hope, Doug said, tears poised threateningly now on his bottom eyelids. Lisette raised her eyebrows and smiled, not nicely, as if to ask what nonsense he was spouting now. Hope the praying bear, he clarified, the one he used to place on Brandon's pillow at night to remind him to say his bedtime prayers. Oh, yeah, I'll be needing Hope the Bear, she said, and there they came, Doug's tears, drawing two stupid streaks down his face. The same cheap tears he cried when he came to her with the affair some years ago, the one she'd never really believed was over. She'd felt his attention wandering for years, and now, yes, she resented the longing he seemed suddenly capable of with these toys. Are you done now? You want to just take the rest, Doug said, believing this feigned apathy his only recourse. But when she said sure and scooped them over to her side of the table, Doug felt his tears refreshing themselves. The lawyer took no particular note of Doug's tears. As a divorce lawyer, he saw grown men cry all the time. He turned to the computer and typed up an agreement for his clients to sign. 37 Beanie Babies for Lizette, Humphrey the Camel for Doug. Thinking, as he often did in these meetings, about his own wife and the way he would undress her when he got home that night. In 10 years, this wife would leave him for her high school boyfriend. High school, the lawyer would be unable to get past this and would keep her best pair of skis, claiming they were lost in the move. But for now, the lawyer typed and daydreamed and believed himself a rational being, unmotivated by jealousy and spite. Thank you. Okay, well, I still have you guys for a second. Um, I wanted to say thank you again to our faculty, Stephanie, John, Helena, Ernesto, and Maureen, and also the amazing poetry faculty, Joni, Alice, Aishan, and Lyrae. Um, thank you guys again so much for coming, and we are having a reception right now up in the English Lounge, which is just upstairs uh, on the second floor. So please join us. Thanks so much for being here. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.